everybody, for coming out this evening on an actual cold winter evening uh, after a very balmy, uh, balmy winter. Um, we're delighted that you're here to have uh, listen to and participate in a discussion about uh, the possibility of a, a National Marine Monument off of uh, New England. Uh, my name is Tom Bell, and I'm the Executive Director here at Maritime Gloucester, a working waterfront museum and uh, educational facility. Um, before we get going, a uh, couple of uh, items if you need to use the restrooms. The restrooms are down the stairs where you came up and sort of across the hall, and uh, it's a little hallway on your right. The, uh, the bathrooms are there. And for exits, it's back where you came in, um, as well as if there's an exit over here um, out, to the, out the back way. Um, I want to just say, too, before we get going on substance, that these events are, um, are, are possible because of members like you and donors like you and also corporate underwriting. Uh, there is a donation box when you first came in. We certainly welcome donations. Uh, we also try, uh, if you're not already a member, to try to get uh, four or five new members every time we do a great presentation like that. So please consider joining. The other is that we do have underwriters. The underwriter for this evening um, is a firm called Pure Strategies. Uh, gentleman Tim Greiner, who's a uh, principal who lives in Gloucester. Pure Strategies is a national a sustainability consulting firm, does work with Ben & Jerry's, Walmart, uh, Stonyfield Yogurt, uh, looking at how to minimize carbon footprints and green the supply chain, and it was really a, one of the leading niche uh, environmental consulting firms in the country. Um, with that, um, tonight's program is our third MG Talks program of the winter. Um, many of you know some of these characters up here. Uh, Vito Gigoloni from Gloucester and the Northeast Seafood Coalition. Uh, Sean Horgan from the Gloucester Daily Times, who will be the facilitator moderator of the conversation this evening. And Peter Shelley with the Conservation Law Foundation. We also have our privilege to have John Whitman, uh, who's a professor at, at Brown University. Uh, and uh, we, we connect way back to graduate school many years ago. Um, and John is going to sort of start off the program uh, giving us a science view, introducing us to uh, the Cassius Ledge closed areas um, and the Coral Seamounts area, and talking about uh, the biological perspective, why, the, why these places, places are, are unique. Um, I want to say that it's important to, to say um, that there is no proposal on the table as it relates to the naming of a National Marine Monument. The White House has publicly stated that they are interested in creating more permanent marine life conservation areas around the country, and various scientific and environmental organizations, including Conservation Law Foundation, CLF, want them to consider these areas off New England because of their science value and the possibility of disrupt, um, degradation through uh, development and other activities. Other organizations, including the Northeast Seafood Coalition and various fishing organizations, have concerns about uh, the implementation of, of permanent protections. Tonight is therefore a conversation, an opportunity to get educated around the issues, and it is not a public hearing. Um, and one reason that we're having it here is that the role that Maritime Gloucester wishes to uh, play, and I think plays well, which is as a place-based community organization, we want to facilitate these conversations, we want to have a very educated population around these critical issues of fisheries and o ocean health, um, and we want to engage people in a, in a future that makes a lot of sense for us all. Um, with that, I also want to thank, before we get going, Melanie Murray Brown, who's put together these MG Talks this, uh, this winter, and she's done a great job, so I don't know if she's here, but let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and I think with that, I'm going to turn it... No, I'm going to turn it over to, or have we switched? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm going to turn it over then to Peter or to Sean. Do you want to say anything to begin with? or we'll just... uh, No, I just, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very happy to see all these people out here tonight. I'm looking forward to uh, what I think is going to be a really informative conversation. And we underline the word conversation. We're not looking for uh, any real sort of debate. We're looking for uh, people just to impart their wisdom on the issue that's ahead of us. 
Uh, and so we're, we're hoping for the same civility in the audience that we will have here up in front of the stage. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Sean. You know, uh, Tom, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be an interesting evening. And um, uh, I'll declare myself right up front. I think this is a great idea. I think this is a winner. Uh, this is a winner for the region. Uh, this is something that we could do that would really be remarkable. And uh, um, I encourage uh, everyone to keep an open mind as I make the presentation. Um, this is, uh, I've been engaged in different ways with Gloucester since 1977 and John, before John was even mayor. Um, and uh, I have to say Gloucester has never failed to surprise me. Um, it has been counted out I don't know how many times, so probably five or six that I've paid attention to and probably many more for those in the audience. And Gloucester always, not only doesn't get counted out, but it comes back with more innovation. So it's a town that I relate to as having a, uh, a real spirit about it, a sense of history, but also a, an awareness um, that, uh, uh, that Time goes on, and uh, new ideas, uh, wind turbines, uh, you've got a state pier, you've got uh, biotech coming into your harbor. Um, you've got one of the m most fabulous programs ever developed for uh, interdiction of addicts uh, with your police chief, uh, a model for around the country. So I'm, I relate to this community with the highest level of respect, and. Um, uh, we're not going to agree on a lot of things. We've, Vito and I certainly have not agreed on much on uh, fishing, um, but uh, certainly Vito and Jackie, another example, the Northeast Seafood Coalition, before that organization existed, there was not a professional dialogue being advanced by the commercial fishing industry. Um, that has all changed now. Whenever Jackie or Vito get up to the mic, I always listen at a fishery meeting because I always learn something. I don't always agree, uh, but the level of discourse since Northeast Seafood Coalition has been here is just remarkable. So um, I, want to, I want to first um, uh, give you a little context um, on this issue. So I want to start off at a pretty high altitude, um, but this isn't the vantage point um, I want to start out with. Um, I want to start out with, with this one. Uh, if you rotate the globe, um, this is another picture of Earth. Um, and it illustrates pretty graphically the fact that Earth is mostly ocean. 70% of it's ocean, 98% of the water's in the ocean. Um, every, the oxygen in every other breath we take comes from photosynthesis from the ocean. Um, it's a very important um, component of the planet. It's, a, it's the critical component of the planet. Um, and I want to put another spin on the size of the ocean, and that is that it's finite. Uh, this is a slide that was done by Woods Hole Oceanographic. So if you took all the oceans of the world, all the water in all the oceans of the world, and put them into a sphere, uh, this sphere here represents proportionally how much water there is on the planet in the oceans. Uh, just for your reference, uh, this sphere here is all the rivers and lakes um, and groundwater. And this sphere, this little sphere over Atlanta, is just the rivers and lakes on the entire planet. But that'll give you an idea um, that we're really talking about a finite resource. And that was something that um, we all have come to fairly late, um, really. And I'll go into that a little bit. So zooming in a little closer. This is our part of the ocean, uh, the Gulf of Maine. It was largely formed by glaciers. Uh, the glacial sheet was down as long as 25,000 years ago, uh, stopped more or less along the edge, the, the line of Georgia's bank. Uh, at that point, so much of the seawater um, was in the ice that the ocean was actually 300 feet or more lower than it is today. So Georgia's bank was, uh, above water and connected to the mainland. There were mastodons and sloths and giant walruses and tundra. And fishermen actually occasionally bring up these uh, archaeological bones. I think they've recovered five walruses from, from George's bank. Um, about 1,500 11, years ago, 
as the glaciers receded and water came back into the ocean and started to fill back up again, um, uh, George's Bank became an island. And then about 6,500 years ago, George's Bank went underwater, uh, which it is today. And although it's underwater, it's still a very prominent feature. Uh, George's Shoals here is, I don't know, about 15 feet. I mean, you could, uh, the, there are stories uh, from the colonial days about people getting off and touching the bottom there. But so it's a, it's a really contained, uh, interesting uh, sea within a sea. It's not uh, in any sense open ocean. We got involved um, probably in the, we'd been doing work throughout the 90s. So we had several conferences with fishermen to look at the impacts of fishing gear on ocean bottom. And we had a number of workshops, produced a bunch of cooperative materials. Um, and then the New England Fishery Management Council got involved with its omnibus habitat amendment. And Vito, I think, will go into some detail about that. Uh, but we started to um, engage in that process. Um, uh, but early on, because of the work we had done previously, the question we had was, uh, is there anything worth saving in the sense of a natural area? Um, we've been fishing here for hundreds of years. People have, prehistory. Um, people have been fishing here, have been dragging here um, for as long as we've had draggers. So the, the ocean floor is very different now than it was um, uh, originally or naturally. And so we pulled together a group of 16 scientists. I think, John, maybe you were there. I'm pretty sure you were there. 16 scientists who had studied the Gulf of Maine and asked them the question, you know, uh, no fancy analysis, um, back of the envelope, do you all think there's still areas that are worth saving? Uh, of course, every scientist uh, identified their project area. And there wasn't uniformity about that. Um, but there were two areas that there was uniform agreement of all the scientists that these areas are really critical they're important and they're still in good enough shape so that they could be, they could at least recover to almost natural conditions. And those areas are the areas around Cash's Ledge, right here. And just again, the geology, this is uh, the ledges part here, um, are mostly granite. And that granite is geologically connected to uh, the granite on Acadia um, National Park. So if you imagine those ridges, it's similar to it. This one ended up underwater rather than above water. But um, so the Cassius Ledge area, and we'll go into more detail. And then these canyons that you see coming off here, the canyons and the seamounts. Um, they were the scientists were generally interested in all the canyons. Uh, they said they were all very valuable. Um, just this will give you a sense. Uh, this is a modern plot of um, fishing activity. This is mostly. Uh, draggers, this is over a three year period, basically shows all the, an estimate of all, I mean, this is a satellite, this is actual footage of um, ships that are out there going at a dragging speed. So the assumption was if a boat was moving below four knots, it was dragging. Um, but you get a sense that fishing activity is very broadly spread. The reason there are some of these openings, um, these are fishery closure areas. So that's, um, Jeffries, this is the Cassius Ledge area. Some of the areas are very shallow. Um, these are other closures. Um, but, you know, that's, fishing activity is extensive. So let's look at Cassius Ledge. Cassius, this Cassius Ledge area is about 80 miles off Gloucester, Portland, Port Clyde. It's kind of at the heart of the Gulf of Maine, physically. Um, this is uh, some bathymetry of the area showing the ledges here to the east, Sigby Ridge along the top, uh, and Fippany's Ledge, which is a plateau, very different than the ledges, but a plateau to the west. And all those areas are within the box. Um, if you zoom down and look at from a topographic map, um, this is what um, it looks like. And I think one of the things that's really important to recognize about this area and its value, and I think John will talk, John Whitman will talk about this more. One of the really important things about this area as a place to um, permanently protect is that virtually all the habitat types 
that are present in the Gulf of Maine, except for the coastal habitat types, are there. The muds, the sands, the silts, the rocks, um, it's all uh, more or less contained, not perfectly, but more or less contained in that area. Um, we were lucky enough to discover that one of the most prominent National Geographic photographers, Brian Scarry, um, actually lives in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, of all places. Um, this guy's done more covers of National Geographic from around the world than anybody. And we asked him whether he would come and take some pictures um, underwater. Cash's ledge, at its shallowest on the eastern side where those ledges are, comes within about 30 feet of the surface at Almond Rock. So uh, Brian's been going out there a number of times. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of his photographic record of his dives. These are the, I think, well known to all fishermen and, and certainly now fairly famous um, kelp forest that's on top of the ledges themselves. Um, there are cod, this is actually, this is a red cod which tends to be a resident codfish in this area. Uh, wolf fish, sharks, there are a lot of marine mammals um, around the entire box. There are right whales there. They've been seen in a, a great abundance at different times of the year. Um, the right whale researchers believe that this is part of the uh, breeding area of uh, right whales. Humpbacks. And just recently, we discovered, because the technology just got good enough, apparently, that they banded the puffins that they raise on the rocks off Maine. They never knew where they went. They'd stayed on the islands for two months, and then they would just disappear, and no one knew where they went. Uh, they finally got a transmitter small enough to attach to their leg, and now they know where they go. They go up to the St. Lawrence for a little vacation for about a month and a half, apparently. They only have 18 data points, so I, I want to say we don't know where they all go. But these 18 birds went up to the St. Lawrence and hung out there for a little while. And then they went due south to the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank. And that's where they spent their entire winter on places like Cash's Ledge, on the canyons, as you'll see. Um, and uh, the young puffins actually spend two years out at sea before they come back and uh, start to nest. But the adults will go back every summer from this, this wintering ground. So there are a lot of seabirds also um, on the, in the Cassius Ledge area. And a number of uh, bird uh, trips are taken there to spot uh, seabirds. Turning quickly to the canyons, um, as I said, the scientists were interested in the mall. Um, we tried to narrow it down to uh, representative can canyons that were farther offshore, that were probably um, you see, okay, <coughs> used less. Um, and uh, the proposal that we think is the best proposal um, includes these three canyons, as well as these two um, canyons up right against the Canadian border. This is the Canadian-US border that comes out across George's Bank. And then it's the 200 mile law limit. So you see it's swinging down here. Um, these dots are ancient volcanoes that were active about 100 million years ago. They're, they're the northern part of what's called the New England Seamount chain. And they start here, and they go down to Bermuda. Um, and uh, because they are isolated from each other, um, they are areas of huge scientific interest because of the endemic biodiversity that tends to be found in these places. They're very deep, and we're talking thou the, the uh, volcanoes, uh, Bear Sea Mount rises, I think, about 7,000 feet off the seafloor, uh, but they're thousands and thousands of feet uh, below the surface of the ocean. Um, NOAA has mapped all these areas fairly thoroughly. Uh, this is sonar mapping, and this will just give you an idea. This is a 3D representation of Bear Sea Mount on the left and Visalia on the right to give you sort of a sense of what they would look like if, if you could go down there. But the, one of the cool things that just happened was uh, they brought their, um, their international exploratory ship called Okeanos to this area and spent a lot of time there two summers ago, I think now, uh, lowering a high-definition camera down to the bottom of the ocean, thousands and thousands of feet, and um, exploring what's down there. Um, and I mean, you have to 
Remember that this is the first time probably any of these animals ever saw light. I mean, there's no light down there. Um, so uh, I have a few slides that illustrate the, the wealth of um, biology that's in these areas. These are the canyons and the seamounts. Um, and they don't really know when it's going to stop. They discover new species every time they dive. Um, and uh, it's pretty exciting. So I'm just going to go through uh, some of the photographs. These are all high definition, probably 3,000 feet deep. Uh, some of these corals are probably hundreds of years old. They grow very slowly at those depths. Uh, they're very vulnerable to being damaged. Uh, they're discovering a fair number of new species of corals. This is actually a fish that ends with saurus, so maybe it's uh, close to uh, a very prehistoric kind of uh, fish. It's a bathosaurus. I don't know, you, ever, you ever catch one of those? No. No, I don't think so. Um, that's a Greenland shark um, cruising along at depths. You also will see swordfish. There's one video that they, that's on their, the Okeanos internet site where they're looking at a, um, like a starfish or something, and a swordfish swims right in front of the camera that's dived from the surface down and is hunting along the bottom. These areas also are major upwellings because of the current coming up. That's what gives Georgia's Bank its biological productivity of these upwellings that are bringing nutrients up. And there's a whole food web um, uh, in the waters above these canyons and seamounts that has turtles, uh, endangered sperm whales, uh, beaked whales, there are killer whales out there, and then as I said, there are puffins. So, you know, the scientists tell us these are very special areas. Um, and I wanted to just list briefly what some of the threats are. The threats in terms of human activities that are or could impact these resources. Um, I think beyond question, the single most widespread human activity, certainly in New England and certainly for hundreds of years, has been fishing. Um, this isn't probably an exact New England uh, otter trawl. The doors don't look like they do. Um, but this will give you an idea. There's also the, the, the foot rope and everything. But this will give you an idea. There's a lot of otter trawl is a very predominant way of catching fish. I have no objection to otter trawl being used, but it is a bottom contacting gear. Uh, some of the other gears that are bottom contacting by design are the scallop gear. Uh, the squid nets apparently are on the, on the bottom maybe 20% of the time. Herring nets sometimes go down on the bottom even though they're mid trawler. So a lot of these gears um, are bottom uh, gears. So fishing is one of the activities that is altering the natural environment. Uh, the other one that, um, again, goes back to 1977 with me in Gloucester is oil and gas drilling. Um, you know, the Angela and Lena and I'm not sure Safadia was even out of diapers at that point. But, um, you know, and John, you know, we took on the oil industry as a group and um, protected George's Bank for fish and for fishing and for its marine life. Um, there is still interest, there is gas on George's Bank. There's still interest in uh, drilling on George's Bank. It's not a high priority, but it is an area that they will never, they have not taken off the uh, potential list. Um, and more significantly, Canada has just recently issued two uh, exploration uh, permits to uh, big companies to put exploratory wells uh, just to the, in the Canadian waters um, and east of George's Bank, but not far east, maybe 120 miles, 130, which is not very far east uh, given the currents out there, and, and that's concerning. But oil and gas is always a threat. Um, the other threat, particularly to the seamounts and to some of the deeper canyon areas, is deep sea mining. I mean, it's hard to believe that it's uh, cost effective to mine at those depths, but it is. It's being done around the world. It's a uh, we know that there are, I'm, we don't know, I'm told that there are minerals there, uh, methyl hydrates and other things that would be very valuable to recover. 
Um, so deep sea mining um, is another activity that would serve as a threat. So I'm, uh, as I'm wrapping up a close here, I just wanted to draw a contrast. Um, you know, New England's got two um, fantastic natural resources, its forests and its oceans. They've defined this region since the beginning of time. Um, on land, um, we have been, in addition to forestry, in addition to farming, in addition to all the activities we use with land, we have understood the importance of having some areas in conservation for a long time. Uh, the first land wilderness area was created by Ulysses Grant in the 1860s. We know that now as Yellowstone. Um, it was created to offset the ravages of the buffalo herds and everything else. Um, in New England, uh, from the Adirondacks to uh, Baxter State Park, they're just for public lands. There are 5,000 square miles of land in permanent wilderness status or ecological reserves or preserved in their natural state. And there's probably at least that much in private lands associated with it. The, the nature, just to give you an idea, the Nature Conservancy um, just bought or recently bought um, a, a chunk of forest land around Moosehead Lake. Um, I think it's 580 square miles, just like that, went from forest land into wilderness. And uh, so on land, we have known that these conservation areas are important and they work well with forestry. They work well with other things. In the ocean, um, we, we have not, we've thought about the ocean differently. It's interesting, back in the 1860s when Grant was protecting Yellowstone. Um, Thomas Huxley, who was known as uh, Darwin's bulldog, um, uh, issued a very famous paper and statement where he said basically the oceans are unlimited. Fish are unlimited. Therefore, it is um, silly to want to try to manage fishing. Um, and that really was a very prevalent attitude, and it didn't go out of style in the 1860s. It, it has persisted pretty consistently that there's this kind of infinite resource that's available. So in contrast to what, we do, what we're doing on land, this is um, uh, Katahdin and Baxter State Park. This is what we're doing in the water. We have no areas that are protected for, in the Atlantic, uh, that are protected for wilderness. They're protected as ecological reserves that are protected for conservation purposes, that are protected for marine biodiversity protection. Uh, we have nothing. Um, and that is, um, that is a, um, a situation that is changing pretty rapidly. You know, we had the two presidents now uh, essentially uh, create large um, reserves in the Pacific, about 490,000 square miles of the Pacific. Countries are doing this around the world. Uh, people driven by modern science are realizing that it's important to have some areas that are um, uh, kept in a conservation status. In New England and the Gulf of Maine in particular, and I'm just about done, um, this is more important than ever. Um, the Gulf of Maine, we're told again by um, scientists at uh, several places now that the Gulf of Maine is heating up faster than 99% of the water bodies on the planet. Um, we are completely unprepared for this. We have no sites that we could use for reference sites. We have no sites that are completely undisturbed where scientists could have long-term studies over the next 10, 20, 30 years and actually document independent of other impacts like pollution, which happens in the coastal areas, or fishing, or anything else that's sort of uh, interfering with a signal of what's happening from climate change. We have no areas where scientists could actually try to understand how climate change is affecting us, how we need to adjust our management rules to account for that. I think with some fisheries, there'll be increases in fish. Other fisheries, they're, they're, they're at risk. So um, learning early when um, some of these signals are starting to show up is very important. So um, I've talked about protecting these areas 
uh, for their conservation purposes, for their wilderness value. I've talked about uh, protecting them for climate change uh, to increase the resilience of the system. Um, but you know, a lot of people are supporting this idea uh, because they, they, they just want to celebrate the ocean. You know, they want to know that there is a place out there in the Atlantic that they love and that they grew up on and they've spent their lives on, whether it's fishermen or others, that is just being left the way it was naturally meant to be. That's important to a lot of people. It may not be important to everybody, uh, but just knowing that there are wild places out there is something that the public cares a lot about. So um, I guess that, that uh, ends my slide. I would like to turn it over to John, who's been diving out in the Gulf of Maine since the early 1980s, um, just to talk about some of these areas from a scientist's perspective. I don't know if you want to see any um, of those. Actually, you can I'd go love back. to go back to the habitat <coughs> diversity slide. Um, OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Great. <clears throat> Here's your water. <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. That was a terrific. <laughs> that was a terrific introduction to um, the reasons why we think protecting Cassius Ledge and the Court George's Brand canyons and seamounts is is important. And we're really at a historic juncture, I feel, at this moment, because um, the amount of truly protected areas in the Atlantic is absolutely zero. I think that's unconscionable. We know as a human society, we're consuming resources rapidly. We're completely changing um, so-called natural areas, and we're not doing anything about it. And um, so you, you hear my, my pitch. Um, what I want to do is provide some scientific background for why these areas are special. And, First, um, just let me say by way of introduction, it's great to be back in Gloucester. It's really fitting that I'm here talking about Cassius Ledge because I started diving on Cassius Ledge and Jeffrey's Ledge in the late 70s going out to sea from Gloucester on the Tioga with um, Dick Cooper's Manned Undersea Research uh, Science and Technology program from Woods Hole. And so, um, all told, since the late 70s, I've spent hundreds of hours underwater on Cassius Ledge in, in submarines, down to about 600 feet, uh, many days of scuba diving on the, the top of the ridge, down to 30 and 40 meters. I've been diving on pretty much every major ledge from Machaya Seal Island all the way down to Halfway Rock in Massachusetts Bay at 30 meters. So that's to say um, the Gulf of Maine is my scientific backyard. I know it really well. But um, just to give you, I have a perspective on the Gulf of Maine because over my career, I've been lucky to work in all the five major oceans of the world, uh, spending significant amounts of time in the South Pacific, uh, each year I spend a lot of research time in the Galapagos. I've seen spectacularly diverse places. Um, and I have, so I have some perspective on what makes a marine area special. And so I hope, I hope you believe me when I say, as does Brian Scarry, that Cassius Ledge and the Coral Canyons and the Seamounts are truly unique places. Um, there are biodiversity hotspots. There's no doubt about it. Um, some of my papers I've shown there's significantly higher diversities of invertebrates like sponges and bryozoans and encrusting organisms, sea anemones, uh, at two sites on Cache's Ledge than at other um, sites at the same depth in the Gulf of Maine. We know um, there's really there's, it's, you know, 
to say it's truly unique is, is wrong. It's unique. That's what the word means. There's no other place offshore in the Gulf of Maine that has a rocky ridge covered with kelp. And by covered with kelp, it's not just on an Ammon rock, as I've heard some people describe. It's everywhere, all the way down to 40 meters for miles north and south of, of Ammon rock. And so, um, has anyone ever been underwater on Cassius Ledge? Has anyone been diving out there? OK, so I don't have any slides other than this. So I just want to kind of paint a, a verbal picture as, of us diving <coughs> from the Rocky Ridge down to the deep basin and describe what you'd see. So you've seen pictures of the kelp. It's a spectacular kelp forest. The kelp are up to six meters tall. We've measured them. We've scraped areas for biomass. There's four kilos of kelp per meter square. Okay, so that's like, you know, nine pounds of kelp. In the coastal zone, if I was to dive off here, say at Thatcher's Island or um, some other ledge at the same depth, there'd be about 100 grams per meter square. So we're talking orders of magnitude higher kelp. Um, so what's important about that is this area, I mean, we're far offshore in the Gulf of Maine, and there's very little phytoplankton productivity way out in the Gulf of Maine. If you look at these satellite maps of chlorophyll, you see really high concentrations in the Bay of Fundy down around off uh, Cape Ann down through the Great South Channel. The water column in the offshore central Gulf of Maine is kind of a desert when you look at it from space. Until you go underwater, what happens is there's a mid-water plankton layer called a chlorophyll maximum layer that's just pea soup and you can't see it from the surface. It's down anywhere between 15 and 50 meters. And this plankton layer comes channeling down the uh, Gulf of Maine and is over this area of Cassius Ledge. And it gets yo-yoed up and down 8 to 20 times a day, bringing all this productivity down to the bottom. And I've studied this, and it's just remarkable. You can see these layers of green water. And so Cash, the topography of Cassius Ledge intersects the water column. And is a, it's Cassius Ledge, this whole area, is a productivity engine that sustains the offshore Gulf of Maine. So just continuing with, with our dive, the kelp peters out at about 40 meters, which is uh, we believe the deepest depth record <coughs> for kelp in the entire North Atlantic because it's far offshore and clear. The kelp break down into fine particles and, and provide nutrition to the animals living in the basins. So there's connectivity from the top of the ledge. So the food webs at the top of the ledge are connected to ones at the bottom. So it's a very holistic, dynamic ecosystem. The, there's shrimp and scallops down here. So it's like, you know, it's, it's been called a mountain chain. It's really not a mountain chain. It's, it's a ridge. It's a ridge that's 720 feet high. But it is the most significant offshore feature, topographic high in the Gulf of Maine. So it's a, it's a sloping rock slope down to about 60 meters, 70 meters, smooth granite covered with algae. They're big basketball-sized sponges. Um, they're vase sponges. It's a, it's a really delicate environment. They're big um, carnivorous sea anemones that are this big. Maybe you've seen them coming up in the trawls. They're rosy pink. They eat shrimp. And they have really uh, powerful stinging tentacles. And then it's like, um, like you're hiking in the, mount, the White Mountains. You're on a steep slope. You get to the bottom of the slope, and there are lots of boulders and cobbles. It's a, it's a talus field. 
And, and so that's another habitat. So we've kind of gone through three habitats so far. And then eventually the rock peters out into sand and gravel. Um, and you get a different, so each of these types of habitats has a different group of organisms that specialize there. And eventually you get into a muddy basin and there are these big tube anemones and um, worms that have giant axons in them, big tentacle crowns and they retract really fast. And uh, there's shrimp, scallops, and the same is true for thippanies. So it's basically the same type of community. So the thing that's wonderful about this is that this high habitat diversity, all these different types of habitats in a small area, guarantees high biodiversity. Even if I'd never been underwater before and I saw all those habitats, I would say that's a hot spot. And it's been shown in ecology a million times in forests and deserts. Everywhere, if you have high habitat diversity, you have high species diversity. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the water column because uh, the bottom isn't the only thing going on. Uh, it's a very connected ecosystem. And I've seen uh, bluefin tuna out there underwater as big as divers, swooping through, chasing herring, actually using the ridge of Cassius Ledge to pin the herring against the ledge. And at times, um, I've laid on my back at 100 feet and watched bluefin tuna come across like fighter jets. They chase the herring, the herring dive to the bottom, the pollock dive to the bottom and then the cod dive to the bottom. And suddenly, there are 200 cod in front of my face. That was in the 1980s. It's not like that anymore. OK, so that's what I want to bring back, is that kind of wildness. Um, and when those downwelling layers go by, they leave a surface slick. And I've studied this. I haven't published it. but. The minke whales key in on the slicks, and they dive down uh, to feed on the animals that are aggregated in the water column. So it's a very holistic, special ecosystem. And um, so my expertise is, in Ca is on Cassius Ledge. And um, I urge you to consider permanently protecting it, not temporarily as is its current uh, protection through the National um, New England Fisheries Management Council. We want this place permanently protected. And really what this is about is leaving something for our children and our grandchildren that's wild and special in the Atlantic Ocean. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> I want to basically give you a, an overview. I mean, we've heard some passionate uh, descriptions of Cash's Ledge. I think, John, I you know, was uh, compelled by a lot of the stuff you were saying there, but I think the stories of, of fishing uh, folks on Cash's Ledge um, and the wonderful trips that you know were spent out there. I do question, I think it's important, I, I, I enjoyed the fact that we have a scientist here because a scientific basis for anything that we do is what's going to be important. And um, one of the concerns I have is what, what we believe has changed on, on Cash's Ledge since 1980. Um, if anything, it's been some, uh, a lot of protections actually that's happened. So it's a little bit concerning. Um, as far as process goes, uh, is a national monument um, executive order the, the correct thing to do in this point, especially after there's been a quite lengthy process for protection? Um, that uh, Cassius Ledge has been protected since 2000, and it's a quite large, it's much larger than the kelp forest or the ledge itself. Um, 
We've done that through the Omnibus Habitat Amendment. And the uh, Omnibus Habitat Amendment, the reason why it's Omnibus is all fisheries controlled by the National Marine Fisheries Service that would interact with that space um, is going to uh, have to abide by. In other words, it's, it's all encompassing uh, the protections. And mostly it's a mobile gear uh, protection. Uh, the MN Rock area is actually uh, protected from all, um, all use. And it's a pretty sizable um, area, about six square miles. Uh, and, it, and it goes deeper than the, uh, I think you, you mentioned 40 meters um, for, for the kelp. Um, so that, that process went on for about 10 years, uh, eight years in earnest, and it took about the first five years to develop a scientific model that could determine just what does need to be protected and what scientifically is there a way to come up with objective uh, methods and models to do that. That took quite a while uh, to get to the point, and they developed a method uh, to do that. It was called the SASE model. Um, but then there's, uh, so we're looking at the process of the Antiquities Act from a fisheries standpoint after during eight years of that uh, process. CLF and a lot of the folks that are, that are advocating for the use of this right now were involved in that process. And the feeling from the fishing community is this is sort of an end run to it. Well, the process got what it got. It was actually quite a sizable closure. And we've, in, uh, fishing communities have uh, conceded to that at this point. And so, you know, this, and, and we haven't talked about delineations yet for the exact, it's the first time actually, Peter, that any of us have seen a delineation, which is the existing West, I mean, Cash's Ledge closure. So it, it seemed like it's been in a vacuum. It's, it hasn't been talked about. There hasn't been really a process for looking at the areas and justifying them, both whether it's scientifically or, or um, and for any other justification that someone may have. And then the seamounts is sort of a preemptive. Um, one feels like in going around, you know, well, we finished the process of eight years of a lot of public input, a lot of, uh, you know, public comments, a lot of testimony, a lot of direct involvement in the scientific bodies and the, and the plan development teams. And then we settled on a democratic process that, you know, the ink hasn't dried on it yet, hasn't been approved, um, but it did go past the first, uh, you know, the council process, and it's at NOAA um, as we speak now. While it's at NOAA, after an eight or ten year process, we're looking at facing potentially this going around and being a permanent protection. That's one. And the seamounts have already initially uh, in, uh, initiated an amendment process to get into the deep sea coral, uh, you know, the science of that. You know, rather than just say, this is just a big area that's wonderful and, and special, um, trust us, President Obama, close it permanently. We use a democratic process and a scientific process and go through the years of doing that. And that's, from a process standpoint, less about the merits of the areas. That's one, of the, probably the biggest concern that we have. Um, as I said, the, the swept area uh, seabed impacts model is the SASE model that was used by the government to, um, and there was a, a broad uh, participation in the uh, creating of that model. Peter Oster uh, was, I know, involved in, in the SASE uh, model. And the alternatives that were selected were based upon that model. Uh, the footprint of non-government research, uh, John mentioned some, uh, quite a bit of experience that he's had out there. But one of the things that the Northeast Seafood Coalition did during the uh, amendment process was there, was there were a lot of compelling stories and pictures and photographs and a lot of media that went out there and, and education that went out there. But we asked, what was the footprint of that photography? What was the footprint of that research? Was it peer reviewed? How intense was it? Um, and we really couldn't come to any uh, any conclusion as to how much that was. It seemed as though it was basically funding dependent. It was very sporadic. There was no time series to it. Um, so when we asked about the intensity, the frequency, and the regularity of non-government science, it was, it was uh, pretty sparse, actually. Um, and th there are papers that have been written and a lot of hypotheses and, con and conclusions drawn from, from not quite that much uh, research. So 
that was a concern. And also the funding, uh, that was the biggest problem, is it's, it's really difficult for the universities and scientists to be able to keep a steady uh, funding stream. The climate change and the effects on uh, the Gulf of Maine have did some, done some re research over the years and looking at this and set aside the issue of climate change and, and the warming in the Gulf of Maine. That's measured, that's done with a thermometer. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? So that, set that aside. Let's accept the fact that the climate is changing. Um, but from this perspective, from fishermen's perspective, the stocks are not moving. And when you look at all of these websites and folks that talk about these research, they, they use justification of evidence um, being what, they, what, what they're seeing in these very sparse research that they're doing. One of them is that stocks are moving east and into deeper water. The cod, the haddock, the pollock, the hake are leaving the area, and something new is coming in. Um, in the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank, there have not been regime shifts. That's what that is, is a regime change where, where you used to find haddock and cod, you're now, now finding black sea bass and scup. It's not happening. Um, so that would show in the landings, that would show in the fishermen. Uh, it's, so there are things used to justify the huge impacts that are happening in the, in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine from climate change, but we're not seeing it in those. Now maybe they're measuring in zooplankton and, and the different organisms that fishermen aren't seeing, but it's very difficult for the fishing community to buy into something when they read that the cod have left, the haddock have left, when in reality they're still here, we're finding them in the same places, in the same densities as we always have, and the variability in catch is a cyclical thing that, you know, you get a couple of years that it's bad, and that happens to be the time that everybody says, see, the cod have left, but then as soon as you tell them, hey, they're back, nobody, Nobody responds to you. No, they're not. It doesn't fit the, the, the model. Um, so the gap between uh, model and fishery independently derived assessments, because that's really what we have. Fishermen's data is not used to determine the size of the stock with the exception of how much fish is coming out. All the fishery dependent data these days is only used to determine how much fish is removed. It doesn't inform how much fish is actually there and what, how much fish is in the ocean at any one uh, point in time or how productive that fish stock is. So that's a problem and the gap now between the model and fishery independently derived assessments is, is, has never been wider uh, between what fishermen see and what um, these independent models are seeing. So that's a real problem and, and when we're talking about fishing community buy-in to something like this, it's really difficult to know that the only way you have to buy into this is in the context of your stocks are in disaster, you know, and the disaster is fishermen are trying to avoid fish that the, that the government's saying doesn't exist. Even recreational fishermen are now saying, what the heck happened? The fish are all over the place and we can't get there. Wait a minute, let's get a national monument out there and bring the biodiversity back. Sorry. Um, so. Fisheries management and uh, caches closure. Um, we were under an effort controlled system and I think that's something everybody uh, should understand. The closure that we have on caches ledge was done as a mortality closure under the old effort control system. Prior to 2010, we controlled fishing by handicapping fishermen. I think Peter and a lot of folks um, on the side of, of Look, we've got to get more accountability. We've got to have a more direct control of fishing than just handicapping fishermen. You know, we agreed with that. But the big fear that we had of getting out of the old effort control system was that it had to rely on good science. You can't have an output control. You can't say this is the only amount of fish that you can catch exactly on every stock unless you can forecast it correctly. If you forecast it incorrectly, and we always did, we've Humans have yet to get a handle on how to get the right estimate of how much fish is in the ocean at any one time on those 19 stocks that we harvest. And once you go to an output control system, what's happening to the fishery, the, what's collapsing the fishery is the fact that the science can't get those numbers right. And we have such an accountable system now through an output control that it reduces the quotas and you're instantly out of business without even going fishing. So that's the effort control system is, is what brought us the caches ledge closure that you see today. Not habitat, not biodiversity, because that was the fishing grounds. 
That's where people caught the most fish. And so they took the areas, not just Cash's Ledge, we had a series of closures in the effort control system. And if you look at them, you took, they took all of the vessel trip reports and log books to say, that's where I was catching my fish. And those were the areas that they, and a lot of fishermen offered that. It's like one way to handicap us is to not have caches open if we're trying to protect codfish. I mean, that's what, that's what was happening. Because the only thing that was controlling us was the days at sea that were allowed. So uh, a lot of the folks that were involved that are now pushing for the monument were, tell were, were telling folks that, you know, you really should let go of the effort control system, go to a direct output control system. If you hit any one of those t uh, total allowable catches, you got to shut down. That's what made fishermen nervous because we knew the science wouldn't get it right. But once you do that, you won't need all these silly effort controls and closures and stuff like that. So that's a another scorn, you know, for the uh, for the for the fishing industry in the in this process. Um, so we in 2010 we changed to an output control system, and then we had the. Uh, um, the Habitat Omnibus Amendment uh, that was completed, seems like forever, like over a year ago, but we're still waiting for the, um, for the government to get into it. So getting to Cash's Ledge from a fisherman's chart, um, look, I'll have to point at it. This is the habitat management area, which is about 125 square miles, 16 miles long. Um, this, this is the area that's closed to mobile gear and as far as we're concerned, that's permanent. I mean, it's, this whole area has been closed, and this has been actually it was a larger area that was the habitat management area. It got slightly smaller, and then we added the Fifties Ledge, um, which is correct, is more of a plateau. And and the uh, the depths, these are fathoms, so that's forty. You know, so this is basically double that would be your meters. So. The area that's encompassed is, is not only the kelp forest and not only that 70 meters, it's, it's much deeper than that. That's 85 fathom is um, 180 meters or something like that. It's, it's, so this is in the basin. This is all the biodiversity that everyone's, you know, that, that John was, was talking about that he's actually seen. Um, and here's your, your uh, basin mud, which is in our view, not unique to any of these areas. In fact, Three Dory Ridge, Harvey Blacks, there's a lot of the ridges that are very similar to a lot of the southern <coughs> that's here. But because you have the, uh, a ledge here and you have this ledge, this, these basins in between the ledges are usually fishy areas. Good. As far as them uh, recovering or not recovering from the, the impacts of trawling, that's what we had an eight-year process determining. There was a lot of, of uh, deliberation of that on, on that. There was Im immense amounts of, of analysis done, certainly more analysis that could ever be afforded by any um, struggling university trying to get enough funds to continue to do research. Um, the, the large area is 1,320-something square kilometers. It's a, it's a huge uh, area. You know, this, this tip right here is about 60 miles from Cape Ann, from Gloucester. This is another 20 miles. So that's a, it's a really big closure that we have right now. This is all for mortality. None of that under the SASE model, the swept area seabed model that was created by the scientists with the best information possible. They were able to use all the research that came from every university and every um, scientist anywhere that did research, their, their stuff was, was front and center and used to develop the SASE model and to develop these models. So it wasn't ignored, it was all incorporated into it. Fishing had very little input into that because that was the technical aspect and hiring scientists, that wasn't something we were doing at the habitat um, level. So we had to sit as stakeholders and wait, and, and when they came up with some comprehensive uh, ways to evaluate it and charts and these little color-coded color things that were used Industry collaborated, then the Northeast Seafood Coalition, and then we got uh, the scallop is, is another um, mobile gear that's used, the scallop dredge. So we worked with those folks and said, look, let's let's be scientific as, as much as we can. Let's utilize the work that the government's done, and let's look at the closed area, I mean, the uh, swept area, seabed model, the SASE model, and come up with the ones that seem to make 
the, the firing, they called it hot spots. And let's propose the closures around those. Let's utilize you know, their information and concede to those. And that's what we did. This area only got closed, and this is my opinion, Peter. It's my, turn, my turn to talk. <laughs> but this large area got closed due to the heavy influence of the environmental community and, and very impassioned testimony and, very, and, and a lot of film and, and a lot of advertising that was in the Globe. And that, the, the pressure that was on the New England Fisheries Management Council and on NOAA was, you know what, Clo keep the whole thing closed and we won't use habitat for an excuse because there was no scientific justification to close this large area. Cod has collapsed. That's, and cod all go, is, we know that this is a great place for cod. How can we in good conscience reopen the effort control area, even though we're under an output controlled system at this point in time? Well, especially with the thousands of, of uh, letters that they received that were form letters, the, 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 they decided we'll keep this as a mortality closure for now, and this is your habitat closure permanently, this is a habitat closure permanently, and this Amman rock one is especially protected. That's the one that was supposed to capture the kelp forest. Um, that's certainly a bottom that none of us would ever even, even go near, but that, that area is closed to all types of gear, I think even lobster gear. I'm pretty and sure. Too. Yeah, man. What's that? And wreck fishing too, I think. Wreck fishing too, yeah. But that's a six square mile um, uh, closure. So um, this is to give you an, another one as far as the scientific you know, perspective of this. And, and I put quotes around it because a lot of work was done by some of the analytical teams. There was one called the closed area technical team had to basically use the sparse data that was out there, and they used the, the, the uh, you always hear about the trawl survey, the government trawl survey. So, you know, it's biodiverse, so there's a lot of, a lot of cod uh, are supposed to be in that area, that's, that's um, you know, an area where, where we're protecting now for habitat. It's been closed since 2000. And so we checked uh, our sales industry and looked to see how many times does the trawl survey actually tow inside the closed area. So, you know, I, I guess I'll jump off this chart for a second and say we actually looked at all the closed areas to see how much activity actually happens inside the closed areas, and they don't treat them special. They're not avoiding them on purpose. It's just that it's such a sparse survey that it's very possible for them to miss them completely in their randomized selection of the stations. So how many times did they sample Cash's Ledge? In the spring of two, the spring survey, once one toe, and a toe inside the survey, if I showed you on the chart what it looks like, you wouldn't be able to detect it because it goes one nautical mile long and it's only 80 feet wide. And they do that once a year and it doesn't matter which part of the, of, the, of the area. So that's the sampling inside Cash's Ledge. Once in the spring, three in the fall. In 2011, one in the spring, zero in the fall, zero in the spring of 2012, one and, and so on. As you can see, 11 times in one, two, three, four, five sampling years, 11 one hour, uh, 20 minute toes. That's all that's been sampled inside Cash's Ledge. From that information, they created a juvenile habitat uh, um, model that would determine uh, essential fish habitat and what's, what's, what's important to juveniles. Low level, historically, when you go fishing for cod, where you go? And you know, these, this is how we define these areas. These are the sweet spots for catching cod. Not when they're scarce, but all the time. This is, this is where the fishery is. So if you fish out here, or if you fish in here, or you fish out here, your chances of catching cod are pretty low. If you catch one, it's a random. That's just the way it's always been. And these are really generous wide areas. There are a lot of places here where you shouldn't be catching any cod either. But the hot spots are in it, and we wanted to draw as big an area as possible. So the next thing we're going to do is overlay how many times does the trawl survey hit that area. The reason I'm getting at this is a lot of this stuff, they're trying to convince folks that we need to close some of these areas because we're going to get a more productive ecosystem, how are we ever going to know if we don't sample it? We're missing it. 
The method that we're using, look, see this is the year that we had the most survey toads. There's, there's the three um, fall surveys and the, and the one spring survey inside the Cash's Ledge. Then they hit it once in the spring. I mean, these are the areas that we're talking about as special. And we don't even look for the very stock that we're using as justification why we need to close the area. Um, now, another concern that we have is, is are we offering in this effort protection or vulnerability? And what I mean by that is uh, what are we trying to protect it from? I think we protect, certainly we protected Cash's Ledge from fishing activity. The seamounts, we want to say we don't think we should preempt that process. We think those fishermen who rely on that area, there are people that, you know, there's an offshore lobster fleet, there's a red crab um, activity out there. And if the mount, if the seamounts, the, the distance between the seamounts and the canyons is an enormous area. And there's fishing that happens in between there. There must be a way to protect, and, uh, and hopefully through that process, just like we did in Cash's Ledge, they will find the areas that are legitimately should be protected from all types of activity. Of course, we're only going to be able to protect fishing at that point. Now, if the environmental community wants to partner with the fishing community and truly protect from, you know, mineral extraction and oil and gas exploration and all that stuff, we're all ears about that. I mean, it'd be about time if we all circled back and work together on that. But I'm, I'm going to be totally frank and let folks know I'm concerned about the, this monument uh, because number one, it's an executive order. It doesn't go through a public process. And what leaves me concerned, and what I would advise folks to be concerned about, is what happens if these go through? Does that become the protection against mineral mining and, and oil and gas? And then the fishery is left, the fishing communities are left to fight to keep that from happening in the open areas. Do we get, what kind of protection do we get in the open areas once we can see that something like this is enough protection? You know, will the environmental community step up? Or as in the LNG, we watched the environmental community take a pass on that, mm -hmm. from what I saw. That was not a very strong um, opposition to that, and the fishing community was left on its own to fight that. Um, luckily, they didn't put any gas uh, through those pipes yet, but you know, so we haven't seen what that what that will cause. So those are really what um, what we're concerned about with this is mostly process and less about the merits of the area because I think we all agree Cash's Ledge is special and what as a fishing uh, ground, you know, and the amount of time that we've spent on Cash's Ledge towing in the basin and making a living there and we closed it for the purpose of protecting cod. Now we're on an output control system, we're living with the smallest cod quota historically ever and fishermen are really tied to the dock knowing that there's no place they can go now and avoid caught. They're everywhere. But no one wants to look. So we're definitely up against the wall right now, and this isn't going to fix it. You know, We're not saying it's going to kill it, but it's not going to fix it. And I think what we need is fixes. And if we're going to get behind an executive order, let's actually get something fixed. We're not going to sample Cash's Ledge once a year and say that we've got to, you know, how would we know if we're getting biodiversity? We have to rely on you, John. <laughs> because no one else seems to be out there doing anything about it. And I think so it's not, I'm not disparaging anybody and just saying let's be realistic what we're, what, we're, what we're trying to protect and what we're not protecting. We want Cash's Ledge protected from things that can really damage it. Clearly if it was damaged by fishing it wouldn't still be putting out what it's putting out all the time right now. The 38 fathom wreck that my father towed next to all the time is still in 38 fathom. Nothing's changed on, on that, and, and it still produces a lot of fish. All the areas that we go to, actually, things are looking better all the time. The only thing that looks bad is that quota ticket. <laughs> so. Well, we've had a lot to think about. Um, at one point in my career, I covered NASCAR badly. And I knew nothing about NASCAR. I, did, I barely know anything about cars. Um, but I found that there was a magic question that I could ask, and it could make it seem like I knew what I was talking about when I was writing my story. And that was, I would walk up to a driver, and I would say, how is your setup? 
And they would talk for 20 minutes about how their car was handling and all that stuff, and I would record it, and I'd go back, and I'd basically write a story, all quotes, explaining how their setup was. Well, what I've realized sitting here, and what I've realized in reporting this previously is, there is no magic question in this issue. Um, it is an issue that is as complex as the environment that we're talking about. So um, I think it's, it's really probably better if we start this conversation on a very basic level, and that is this. Is this proposal an end run around the regulatory process? Um, this proposal is our idea of what's important out there and ought to be protected. This is, those are the lines. We took the council's lines and used them rather than strictly following the biology, which might have changed the shape there. On the canyons, we used the council's line for where the head of the canyons was to go out. Um, this is not an end run around that process. Um, no one worked harder than the Nordic Seafood Coalition over those eight or 10 years um, on that. The issue is that that process unfolded under the Magnuson Act. And the Magnuson Act has one objective, which is to produce seafood, optimum meal. That is the beginning and end of that statute. Um, and it's a good statute, it's an important statute to have. It does nothing to protect whales, birds, sponges, corals, anything else. Those, the only tool that is available to protect the diversity of sea life that I've tried to illustrate is out there in those areas is the Antiquities Act. Congress created that act to give the president authority, any president, presidents have used this since Roosevelt hundreds of times, any president authority to identify and protect areas of great scientific interest. Um, we think these areas qualify. There's a, there, there are more questions than answers for any place in the ocean, uh, including these places. So it's not like I or any or a scientist has answers to all of Vito's questions, but the scientists know that this is a special place. And the Magnuson Act just it doesn't get there. You know, it, it regulates fishing activities. Um, out on the canyons and seamounts, it doesn't regulate oil and gas drilling. It doesn't regulate deep sea mining. It's focused just on fishing. Um, and so what, what we're trying to encourage people to do is think about how cool it would be, just theoretically, to have a place out there that was just a refuge for everything. Um, and one of the, one of the Lucky things, I guess, for lack of a better word. It's hard to use the word luck and the fishing industry in New England in the same sentence. But one of the lucky things is, is this area has been closed for fishery purposes, um, exactly as Vito laid out. Um, I mean, his, his narrative was exactly on point. That's how it happened. The lines were designed by fishermen, mostly. The council adopted them. Um, but it's been closed almost exclusively since 2002, so there has been a recovery, and, and we could get into the details of the recovery that's been, that has been documented out in that area so far. It's still early. But, um, so you could protect all those animals in that place at virtually no cost to the fishing industry. And there's no other place that's equally special from a science point of view and equally cost-free from the fishing industry's point of view, which is, which is why to us, you know, listen, anytime the federal government comes in to say, we're here to help you, I, I get it, you know, but the president is the person who has the authority to create these. This is the statute Congress created to do this kind of thing. Um, there is no process in the statute. I guess in the 1900s, <laughs> they didn't have an uh, Administrative Procedures Act or anything, but so there's no process, and it's what, it's what the White House decides is necessary. There is a comment line that's open that people can send in their concerns, their questions. Ultimately, the White House will make this decision. And within, within that process, which is really a political process, where are we? Um, what, what is the role of the environmental community? Has there been an, an extended lobbying system? Or has it been a more of a, an amorphous approach? Well, we're, and what are you hearing from the White House? Um, we're not hearing anything from the White House. Which they, makes you they don't, they hardly don't, exclusive, I think. They don't talk to us about their plans. But um, 
you know, this, this, is the, um, this is the reality. We are trying to educate as many people as we can about these sites and why they're important. It's not just the environmental community that are supporting these areas. I mean, there are faith-based communities, there are marine businesses, there are high-tech businesses, and these aren't people that we twisted their arms. I mean, you don't, someone, uh, people think that a lot more is protected out there than actually is. And as soon as people realize that there is a place that needs protection, they respond to it. We, um, the president has said um, in last June, um, after he did the Pacific protections, that he was interested in doing more. Um, he thought they were a good thing for the country. He thought they fit in well with other marine activities that were going on. And so we're, I guess, taking that at his word and trying to show everybody why they should support this, why they should be writing into the White House and encouraging the White House to exercise that authority under the Antiquities Act. From the, from the perspective of the proponents of, of this idea, of this concept, um, is it a zero-sum game? Does it have to be caches and the seamounts and canyons, or could it be one or the other? It could be nothing. I mean, that's, but that what is, would be the preference of, of the I, th I think th these areas are all different. Um, and they all capture things that are really uniquely available. They're, they're not areas like this anywhere else. Um, in our, you know, there, there are other canyons. Um, there are other places. Um, there's nothing like Cassius Ledge, I think, as John pointed out. Um, there are no other seamounts. Um, we think we picked some canyons where there's very little fishing activity. Most of that box is below fishing depth. It's, you know, it's, uh, I think the Cassius Ledge box is about, that one that's up there is about 1.5% of the Gulf of Maine to give you, yeah, it's a big box. It's 500, you know, 50 whatever it is square miles, but the Gulf of Maine is 36,000 square miles. So this is a piece, um, but it's not a huge piece. The, the canyons, if you just look at sort of the fishable areas, uh, shallower than 600 meters, say, which probably is the depth at which crabbing stopped. I don't, I don't know exactly. Sure. It's hard to get information on this. Um, about that, say that depth. That's about 1% of that shelf resource. Fishing is, is, has got access and control of everything else. We think that this is a really great package that captures a lot of very unique biological features that um, have made New England oceans really the resources they've been. So, Sean, I'd like to, so the process, I think that's the, you, you identified really, Peter, a weakness in the U.S. law, I guess, right can now, right? Can you speak so we can hear you? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, to, to the process, you know, Peter talked about um, there is no other mechanism, I guess, in place right now to really, truly protect something unless you get an executive order. And, it, it seems to be a little bit of a, an absurd result, right, mm -hmm. that the stakeholders who have, you know, a law in place with a big structure and history and all of our use has been contemplated in the law or it's all addressed in the law, our impacts on marine mammals and all of that stuff right. is, all, right. is all taken into account, um, that we would have our process overwritten, yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. that it would... It just seems absurd that because we have a bunch of potential threats to the ocean that we all care about, mm -hmm. that the U.S. law, an executive order should be put into place to put a process in place that wouldn't allow a permit to be pulled, for example, for you know mineral mining right. with a stroke of a pen. You right. should have to go through what we go through to open up a little fishing ground, right? right. right. So. It, it just seems counterintuitive to say that we're going to celebrate using a process that we just got finished with eight years of science and, and stakeholder input, all of us, you know, participating in a process and then closed the area with the knowledge that we're going to have the opportunity in between some of those cherished areas to maybe be return to fishing. Right. And because we're, you know, we're anticipating some other permits or uses coming in that we're going to use executive order. And we know, I mean, this is a political thing yeah. right now. I mean, Obama administration's made it clear and they wanted to announce it in Chile. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they want to do this for a legacy. Right. And that's 
we get it politically, you know, we yeah. all understand the politics, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it's, that's it at face value because if, the, if what's the weakness in the law is that we don't have a, a parallel process for those other uses, then we better get one. Yeah. That's what we should be working on as opposed to, that's my opinion, as opposed to having the fishing community feel like we just went through a mock drill, you know? All the work that we did, all the collaboration, all of the work we did with the other fishing groups to come forward with something that was scientific and not economic. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was yeah. we got to t we took the economic hits by trying to do the best we could with that. Right. Um, and now it gets trumped. You know. That you know, wrong word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it go, <laughs> gets superseded. I mean, this is just quickly again. This yeah. is this is the process Congress set up for this. Uh, it's a mechanism that is meant to allow a president to move quickly, not get caught up in a long debate about whether this should be done or not done. Um, there are most, not most, but a lot of the national parks and other places we have now first started out with this process. You know, if you're, if you're gonna have, anyway, that's, this is the process Congress um, has picked. And, uh, just so people would understand what would happen if this happened, you know, the next, uh, the, the sort of the parameters of what activities would be allowed or not allowed would be determined by the White House. Um, it would be in the designation itself, typically land or water, the um, activities that are inconsistent with sort of protecting and advancing the scientific reason for created in the first place are prohibited. Right. And other activities like navigation or other things typically would be allowed. Um, a management plan um, is created typically in which the public um, participates um, and over time. And um, so it's not, it's not a uh, kind of a bolt out of the blue completely. There is, there is a pretty significant process on the tail end of this. If, if I understand the basis for the entire National Monument system, most of which are obviously is land-based, it is to, to, to create areas that, will allow, that we will allow to stay wild, that we will allow mm -hmm. to stay pristine, but also these areas will be areas that people will have access to mm -hmm. and people will be able to visit and that, that they will be created within a certain proximity so that yeah. people can, can visit them regularly. Who would, who would be able to visit these monuments? I mean, who, who are we talking about? Can somebody just get in a boat and ride out there? It's, it, you know. Yeah, you can go diving on caches, but. But I mean, again, how many people will actually be allowed that, to, or, or, or able to take advantage of that? The, the premise is not exactly accurate. I mean, there are a lot of wilderness areas created um, in the far north tundra of Alaska that no one's ever going to go to. but. People in Ohio felt good about it. They liked knowing that there was at least a place up there that was going to be kept in that state. Uh, there are places in the Pacific Ocean that have been created that no one's ever going to go to. I mean, it is, it would take you months to get there. No one's going to go, but um, they serve their science purpose. They're, they're protecting the resource. They're keeping the biodiversity there. And that's really the purpose of the monument. It's not, it's not a, the National Parks Act. It's not, it's not, focused on providing people with recreational opportunities. Although I have to say, a lot of the whale watch operations in the region are very supportive of this approach. It gives them an aquarium, so it gives them something to talk about. You know, we've got this great place out there that's wild, and they think this is something that's attractive to them. And, and again, you know, Vito, I remember you t talking about how your father spent his whole career on Cash's Ledge, practically. I, you know, I don't know how many years that was, but I, I remember when you said that at the mic, and that's a really stirring story. And I, you know, I'm probably crazy, but I, you know, I just, that's why I'm sort of hopeful that Gloucester maybe will do one of its unexpected things and say, you know what, we have, we have been taking from the ocean. The ocean has been giving to this community. It is who we are for 400 years. Um, you know what? This is okay. We can we can live with this. I mean, this would be a nice tribute to the ocean. I'm seeing hands go up. Um, I'm sorry. I don't think we made this uh, made this clear at the beginning. What we're going to do is we're going to have this conversation, and then we're going to have a Q and A. 
So if you can just hold those questions until we get to that point, uh, we'll try to get to you then. I know we're, we're probably running a little late as, as these things usually do, but I think people are still pretty, pretty into it, so we'll just keep going. Vito, if this happens, what is the direct impact on the Northeast multi-species ground fishing industry? Well, for the Caches Ledge um, closure, it, it basically takes something, it takes an old effort control that was fisherman designed. Um, it was a historical fishing ground that everyone thought once we went to the output control, we'd be able to revisit and now it would be permanently closed. So it would be, it, it, I think it would be a, a, a kick in the pants. It would be a feeling, and it's not about the economic activity that would go on, you know, that, that we could return there. It's a matter of, we participated in a process for eight years and then found that it was all for naught. And, and to me, that's not a, the way to use the president's authority. You know, protecting it from us, we, we just did it voluntarily so that we could revisit it later. So um, I think it's more of, I mean, if, if, if a lot of the folks that participate in the process right now, and there aren't many left, feel like they're really wasting their time, um, I don't know what kind of fishery we would have, to be honest with you, because the threats to the fishery now require so much dedication and sophisticated thinking about what need, what's coming next, um, that it's not going to survive. And I, and I think it's a, it's a process. I, what, what's hurting us right now is the, is, is, is the process, you know, is that we, we have one in place, we have an, a use that's been contemplated thoroughly in the law, we went through a full process, it hasn't even been signed yet, you know, it hasn't even been implemented, and now we're facing this. So I, I think it's a, it's a discouraging, if, if people are just trying to discourage the fishing community, it's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a way to do it? And, and retain the fishermen's option or, or potential option for, for fishing these areas and still protecting it from the other uses that, that are a concern? There isn't any way, it would be dishonest for me to suggest yes. I mean, the purpose of this is to create a, at least at a minimum, a reference site, a site where you can find out actually what happens long term. Not, seven, 10, 15 years. Some of these areas we know from the science, John can probably correct me, could take 30 to 50 years before they fully recover. I mean, that, that area was fished heavily for hundreds of years. It's in the earliest charts. So it's highly disturbed. And that's, in fact, a lot of the national forest was in exactly that same condition. When it was made into national forest, it was clear cut and it took hundreds of years for it now to be the forest that we see. We think it's, it's not a bad idea just to take 1.5% of the Gulf of Maine that's the most special and say, let's, let's just let it be and see what happens. Why now? Uh, John well, was because saying... the president's going out of office and he said he's interested <laughs> yeah. in hearing ideas. But I mean, is, is, is there also another impetus in, in terms of timing? And John was saying that uh, we've done nothing to this point and, and now is the time. Um, but where was this idea 10 years ago? Where was this idea 15 years ago? Um, George Bush was the first president who used the Monuments Authority to protect ocean wilderness areas. Um, so in terms of you know, its evolution, the, the statute's evolution, um, it's been a fairly recent uh, event. Um, and you know, this is a, you know, as, as Vito will probably attest to, I mean, certainly our organization participated in this process, the Omnibus Habitat Amendment. And I think from day one, we said we ought to permanently protect Cash's Ledge. I mean, we were never inconsistent about that. We did not even, we, we didn't know um, what the White House, this White House, uh, wanted to do with further ocean monuments until just recently. It wasn't, it wasn't our timing. Well, you, you saw it wasn't an great timing. You saw an opportunity. Then. There was an opportunity. The Omnibus Habitat Amendment had stretched out from something that was supposed to take four years, I think. Yeah to 10 years and it's still going. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was like this, this uh, potential, this opportunity is leaving the station. And we think we have some great sites that a lot of people support. We should advance them now. 
So there's, there's some uh, designated research habitat areas was part of the, uh, you know, they weren't really that comprehensive, I'll, yeah. I'll admit. But um, we supported any place that we were not, we volunteered, we're not fishing there. We, we agreed to these permanent HMAs, right, habitat right. management areas, that science should be going right in there and start to um, determine what the benefits are. Now, unless there's a huge, another way to use executive order is let's make sure that we actually do that, mm -hmm. that we're not doing it because during this habitat process, and I'm on the sack with Priscilla on, on the, you know, with the Stell wagon, um, we've had areas closed for over 20 years and the research that's out there that's happened in the last 20 of even 25 years on these closures to determine the differences between <laughs> fished areas and not fished areas. Yeah, is it different? Of course. But is it better or worse? No one knows. Yeah. So there's been, and there's not even any real studies, any ongoing studies with a time series going on to do that. I think that's again part of the process problem is we're talking about let's do something to protect wilderness because trust us, it's going to get better, but then we're not going to measure it. Yeah. Close that area because it's going to rebuild cod, but then we're not going to sample it. Um, so that's that's it's all about you know process and I and I think if I wasn't in, in fishing anymore and I backed out learning what I learned in this that's the first thing I would say is that you know what there's a lot of talk about what it's going to produce but no one's going to check and no one's funding checking you know so it's like why I hate to say why do it if we're never going to find out whether we get the benefits let's just pretend that we did because we got it closed and then and give up on the fishing revenue that could happen from the year. Maybe it could revitalize one of these fishing communities and up in Maine that relied heavily on Cash's Ledge. Maybe they would be able to come back if, if they actually had that area opened again once we get the, the, the quotas corrected yeah. based on new assessments, right? So closing it is a, is, a, is a real issue unless you can determine what the benefit is really going to be, not just trust us. But it's interesting that even the council's technical staff, and believe me, Vito, I'm not saying that, that this was quantitative or hard science, but, you know, in the analysis, as you know, they concluded that the greatest social and economic benefits associated with the different alternatives that were being considered for Cassius Ledge was to keep it closed. Because there is a body of science that does say and I'm not trying to sell it to you on this basis. No, I know. Um, because it's, you know, it's not there yet. But there's a body of science that says if you create a area that is of some size, it can't be a postage stamp, the fish in there will grow, they will reproduce and spill over. There have been studies that John Grabowski and the guy from GMRI, I can't remember his name. Graham Sherwood. Graham Sherwood have yep. done that have now, even just seven years of uh, closure on caches, um, they have documented that the codfish inside caches are, uh, they're more old fish inside than outside, and the fish are fatter and longer than the fish yep. inside. So, that, you know, this is early time still, but really, it, it, you know, it's, it's, they're just important questions. And I, I would, you know, I would encourage the fishing industry to think, okay, how, th this research is important and it could be used elsewhere to great effect. Um, and so this is, seems to be a low-cost way of at least protecting the possibility of that research in the future. Do, do you see any, uh, do you, well, I guess back up, do you agree with Vito when he, when he points out that there hasn't been really very much sampling of this area whatsoever? So that in that regard, we don't really know what we're dealing with over time on a consistent basis. Would you guys also like to, you guys, would the environmental or the proponents of this this idea, would you like to see more sampling in that area? I'd like to see more sampling everywhere. I mean, I think the issue Vito pointed out of the gap between what fish and sea and what the scientists say is out there is outrageous. It's just in it, it's you know it's uh, irrational. Well, it's, gr it's growing wider every day. So. Well, and it does seem to be growing wider. So I would I would never say don't do more sampling. I think there has been a fair amount of sampling taking place. Maybe it hasn't been published yet. John's got about half a dozen papers piled up. There are scientists who go out there, and what I've heard is that scientists would go out there more if they could be assured that their that their gear was not, you know, it would stay in place for several years. So, 
you know, it's closed to most fishing, but herring fishing still takes place in there. You know, that, that could grab up a fair amount of both fishing gear and science gear. Um, and there are other fisheries that are in there that cause a problem. So I, I don't think there's any shortage of scientists who would love to have that as their laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're running long here, um, so I think it, you want to take some questions? Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. Valor. Um, so, Peter, in looking at national monuments in the West, yeah. um, when they are formed, they do grandfather in existing uses like ranching and other. Yeah. Right? So, presumably, fishing effort could be grandfathered into this national monument and conceivably in a management plan could assure that it, science shows Okay, is there a question? We need questions. Could be opened up. That's, so that's one thing yeah. we said. But to bring back what um, Vito said, and I'm concerned about one particular comment you made. You mentioned that marine businesses and high-tech businesses are very supportive of this national monument. Is that because all the rest of the ocean that's not in the monument then becomes open to them for sand and gravel, my aquaculture? No. No. How, what are you doing to protect non-monument areas? That's, that's we're a doing, great concern here. We're doing what we've always been doing. We're still going to be doing that. This is a, this is a tiny little spot. That's, this isn't the solution to the ocean's health. Shouldn't your effort be rather put on... Our effort is also put on that. It's, it's put on... We review every sand and gravel mining proposal that comes up, and there are going to be a lot more of those because of climate change. Um, we review the Canadian oil proposals. We review the proposals to grow the oil terminal in St. John's, um, New Brunswick, because an oil spill <coughs> coming from St. John's would, if it was an Exxon Valdez spill, would cover the whole Cape. It would be down below Cape Cod. So, our group anyway, we can't do everything, but we do cover those other issues. Aquaculture? Aquaculture, we, we were um, right here with the uh, Gloucester Tire case. Maybe some of you don't remember the Gloucester Tire case, but um, some of you probably do. Damon is shaking his head. Um, we fought that. So, uh, you know, we can't do everything, but we, and this is, this is not anti-fishing. This is not against the fishermen. That's not the purpose, at least we have for it. It's something really neat that we could do it at virtually no cost to fishing, that we could learn a lot from, that could benefit fishing, we think. We can't prove it yet. Joe. Joe, yeah, just a comment on what you said about, you know, sourcing these small areas or whatever. Where do you benefit? Well, I think it's a community or something like that. Um, you said the same thing 18 years ago, when we closed the rest of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we haven't gotten no benefits out of that at all. The show closed and it will never open again. And even in your earlier comments, you, you said that we really have no permanent closures in the Gulf of Maine. That was wrong. Because we do have the rest of the Gulf of Maine closure. I'm sure it could be put back up on the board so the people can see it. It's a humongous, tremendous amount of area that we closed 18 years ago. And we will promise that we will revisit it, like Rita said. It, there will be a sunset to it and everything. It never happened, it never will, it never open again. A lot of it now is all habitat culture. So how can the fishing community believe you? I mean, you know, yeah. how, how can we say, you know, yes to something that you said many times in the past and then turn it back on? I, I don't think I ever said that the Western Gulf of Maine closure was going to be permanent. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to last. It's not an HAPC, so it, it could theoretically be open. And it's heavily fished recreationally. So it's, it, it, but not by the mobile gear? Not, not by the mobile gear. The mobile gear goes all around the edges and I think catches a fair amount of fish. But it doesn't go through there. Um, but I don't recall ever making a promise that Either it would be opened at a certain time or under certain circumstances, or that it would be closed permanently. Yes, sir. Oh, Al, uh, yeah? I just find it kind of funny when I mean, a lot of us can go into council meetings the last 20 years and wait very well. You would always get up to the mic and always push for the most you know, things that you think are the biggest closure. Then you get up and say, well, we could have closed the whole thing. Now, the first time that 
the process and science fails you, you do it the second round. I mean, we've, we've all seen it happening. Now you're using the, um, I can't believe you put it that way, you use a justification of, wouldn't it be cool? You know, <laughs> I mean, no. wouldn't it be cool, yeah, to you, but there, I mean, there are still legitimate uses for that area that this community, you know, could benefit from. Not everyone is obviously going to agree with this. Um, again, the analysis is if you opened it up for fishing, it would be fished out within two or three years, I think was what the uh, conclusion was. I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I don't think I'm making this up. I mean, that's, that's what the analysis was. Um, and then it would be right back where you were. So, How would you fish out when we have a high tax balance? Well, because that's where the concentration of fish would be. And so people yeah. would target it because they'd get the they highest sample. catch per unit of effort in that area. Yeah. Well, the, there is sampling going on out there. They've been using the highest, they've been using the concentration excuse for the last 20 years also. I, no, that comes from fishermen who have said, this is what we want. We want to be able to get back in there because that's where the concentrated fish are. Uh, I mean, it was in the Portland Press Herald. Terry Alexander, a council member, said that. I'm not, again, this is coming from another fisherman, not from me. Yeah, but concentrations of fish, of fish and fishing it out are two different things. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't see how you can, with, with the hard quarters, I don't, I don't see how it can happen. So you're, you're, you're lumping two things together that, that don't really match. Anyone else? Dave? Just as I was listening to this tonight, my reaction was that by implementing this national monument on Cassius Ledge, you were as likely to be endangering it as protecting it. Because the, the minute you implement this, then the oil rig people and so forth, they're going to say, oh, well, the important part is protected now. Now we can use the rest. Mm. And if you were 70 miles off Grand Isle, and if BP had a problem, your national monument would be gone. <laughs> they're, they're doing that now, Damon. You know that. They don't give a damn whether there is a monument or not a monument yeah, out they there. They might get away, they'd be more likely to get away. No, if the absolute opposite would happen. It would be <coughs> another, an additional reason not to do that kind of activity. I, I, think it's, I think it's completely flipped around the other way. Jackie. So I just wanted to quickly comment with the, with the general public may not fully understand. Um, it's not just the quasi-process when people talk about process. Um, the years of the meetings, the years of the science that are brought forward, the analytical team, the models that are designed. But the reason why um, it was last June when the council took the final action on the habitat amendment. And the reason why we're not done yet is because now it requires a whole nother review. We have a whole um, thorough review that goes on with NOAA with an economic and environmental analysis and NEPA requirements and what have you that now goes through a whole nother review process before it comes out to the public for public comments and, and what have you. And so there's multiple layers of of um, biological reviews, democratic <laughs> process, and you know, and, and follow-up analysis that takes place to make sure that we fully understand what the environmental consequences what, what may, might be, pros and cons, um, what the economic impacts may be, pros and cons, and this just doesn't do any of that. You know, it doesn't have um, by using you know, the Antiquities Act from the early 1900s. They they didn't think that these Magnuson laws or even green protected area laws or anything else coming later on would actually take place. And so there's a process for all of this and very thorough reviews that the fishing industry has to abide by. I mean, they, you know, fishermen pay the Northeast Seafood Coalition per to participate in all of these process processes that have been developed by the law that, you know, is a, is a democratic process. And so, you know, it's, it's, it seems for us, whether it's caches or whether it's the Western Gulf Maine closed area or whether it's the canyons or wherever it may be, it seems it seems like it's it's not really with where we're at today with a lot of our other management um, regimes. So I just wanted to make that quick comment. Thanks. Okay. 
and in the back. I heard a lot tonight about the, uh, the eight year process with the ground vision community that's completely circumvented by this monument designation. And I sort of want to talk about another process um, that is also completely ignored by this designation process, or the designation. Um, and that's what the red crab industry is going through, and that's a uh, small crabbing fishery in the canyons. Um, we were the first crabbing fishery in the United States to get MSC certified, currently recommended by Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, I mean, for the past 10 years now, we've been putting scientists out on the boats, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which isn't a lot necessarily to some of these organizations, that's a lot for us, um, have been spent, you know, trying to push the sustainability of the fishery. We're very proud of that. Um, and then to have an organization come in and decide in the last couple of years that, you know, it would be cool to make this a sustainable area. We agree with that. We've been agreeing with that. We've been pushing that as a community. And I guess my question here is, is if you take away that motivation, I mean, all of the hours and all of the money that we've put into pushing those certification processes with Monterey Bay, with MSC, um, New England Aquarium, we worked with them as well. I mean, how is that going to affect the future of commercial fishing if that incentive is completely stripped? I, I, <clears throat> I guess I'm not sure I completely understand the question because I don't, I don't think the incentive that you have now would be stripped by uh, having this uh, permanently protected under the, as a monument. I, you know, I don't, this is, a, again, it's impossible, just like uh, fishing community. Uh, there's so few people, you know, the red crab fishery is one operation, um, and the whole East Coast, one set, is that, are you working in the red crab fishery? Okay, so there's an example. Um, because there's only one fishing operation, uh, the public, no one in the public can actually understand anything about that fishery because the data is all proprietary and confidential. Um, so uh, we know that this potentially involves a segment of the whole shelf that you're now fishing on. It doesn't include by far um, much of that whole shelf. It's a small piece. Um, but it may have impacts, and that's a, a comment that um, John Williams has already put in. Um, he's articulated, he's got a fabulous fishery um, that he developed, and presumably he'll continue to make that point um, through the comment line and other places he has access to to make sure the White House understands how, how this might affect him, and people who work for him, and, and the people who want the seafood. Okay, we're gonna have, I think we're gonna do one more. And, uh, in the back. So are you saying that down in Ohio we're employed within 135 families doing red crabbing? No. Because it sounds like that's what you're looking towards, is the people in the middle of the country have more input into how our community works. No, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that this is a public resource. This is owned by everybody in the public. Not one fishery, not one community, not a conservation group. This is a public resource. Thank you, Democratic Thank you, Conservation Law Foundation. Isn't, isn't oil the public? Is it Excuse me. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. We weren't going to do it this way. Uh, Kara, are you done? Yes. Thank okay. You. Sir, do you have a question? Sir? Okay. Hey, That's not. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Okay. I was at the last council meeting in, in, in New Hampshire, and the pro I'm a midwater fishing boat, and I also own a person. And there was a proposal put up by surrogates of the NGOs, which is John Coppolato down in Cape Cod, to ban midwater fishing in all the areas that we catch fish. Now, to me, that's vindictive management and it was put through to the council that's going to be talked about. Now there's been a survey that done by National Marine Fisheries that shows that midwater fishing does not disrupt herring stocks or herring fish, shoals of fish. Yet it was never talked about, it's never talked about by the NGOs, and to me, it's what I saw at that, been, that meeting was vindictive type management, which to me should have no place in any fishery management. And that's put forward by you guys. Okay, so I guess there wasn't a question. 
Um, anyone else? I think that will probably close it out. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Speakers, I thought it was, uh, from my perspective, anyways, incredibly informative and really understanding some very complex issues. So, uh, thanks all for coming out. I hope to see you on March 31st.